and for authors. We will start as a subcommittee as soon as we have an author. And I can share with you now uh, both the bills that have been pulled as well as those that are on consent. The items uh, that have been pulled, first one that has been pulled is uh, the special order uh, AB 2072 by Assemblyman Mendoza on the hearing screen screening. Um, I have asked that that be heard next week instead, so that will not be heard today. The other bills that uh, are not being heard have been pulled by the authors. Uh, the first one is item 4 AB 1701 by Assemblyman Chesbro on hypodermic needles and syringes. Uh, the next one that has been pulled by the author, uh, item 6, AB 1858 uh, by Assemblyman Blumenfield on hypodermic needles and syringes. And then we have uh, two bills on consent. Item 5, uh, AB 1783, Hayashi, licensed dentists. And um, item 12, AB 26 by 2635, Portentino, communicable disease involuntary testing. So uh, that will leave us with eight bills uh, that we will be hearing today. And we have Assemblyman Portentino here. Uh, welcome. We will begin, and this will be item 2, AB113. Good morning, or good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Good, and you? Thank you. Um, last year, um, after extensive negotiations with the insurance industry, the legislation, legislature passed AB 56 to provide notification to women regarding um, when they should be screened for breast cancer. Um, AB 113 seeks to follow uh, that bill, and it has wide bipartisan support. It passed the Assembly Health Appropriations and Floor with no no votes. Um, it deletes an outdated reference to the insurance code that limits coverage for mammograms based upon a woman's age. AB 113 will require health insurance companies to cover mammograms for screening purposes for breast cancer when it is ordered by a physician, nurse, practitioner, or nurse midwife based on the woman's individual circumstance and risk factors. While health insurance policies are currently covering mammography to screen for breast cancer, many women are unnecessarily dying because they do not know when to start being screened. AB 113 will help solve this problem by requiring health care plans in California to provide information to women regarding when they should begin to be screened for breast cancer. Um, this bill came to me in the post office, believe it or not. I was cornered by um, young women in my district after one went in to have her first mammogram at 40 and was diagnosed with breast cancer in both breasts. And it sort of sent a shockwave through my community and women came to me and said, please look into what we can do to make sure that younger women are uh, appropriately diagnosed and screened. And so after research into this issue, we've come up with this solution and I respectfully ask for an I vote and I have witnesses in support. Thank you, and before we go to that, um, will you be taking the amendment which would sunset the current health insurer provisions consistent with the date the provisions provided for in the bill would begin? Yes. Good. And I might also say I would love to be a principal co-author on this bill. It's a very important issue. I have particularly a lot of uh, young Latinas in the San Jose area who do not have this kind of in, uh, coverage. And then when they are able to have a mammogram, discover that they have breast right. cancer in one or both breasts. Well, and I'll be honored to list you as a principal co-author. Thank, Thank you, Senator. And we are doing um, either, well, we're doing uh, two witnesses, three minutes each, yes. So who would like to speak in support? Erin Evans Feudum with Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California in support. All right. Anyone else in support? 
Hello, I'm Alice Knight. I'm with the seven California affiliates of Susan G. Komen for the Cure, and we're in strong support of the bill. Thank you for your support, you. all of you. Thank you. Opposition? Well, we're not able to establish a quorum yet, and as soon as we do, we will take the bill up for vote. If you, did you want to make a brief closing comment? Just, uh, we believe this bill will help save lives and bring early detection and respectfully ask for an I vote. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here so promptly. A couple more. Oh, Shannon was also a supporter. Yes. Yeah. Yes, if she might. Do you want to say you're a supporter? Yeah, uh, Shannon Smith Crowley, American Congress of OBGYNs. I um, think that we need to have this bill to clarify the law. Okay, thank you very much. And our vice chair is here. Thank you very much. And when we have a quorum, we will vote okay. on the bill. Two more, I think. Pardon me? I have two more. One, uh, one more. One was, uh, oh. you have one. Which one's on consent? This, this one's one is on, oh, consent. is on consent. Item 12 okay. is on consent, and you have item 13. Wonderful. Um, I'm here to present ACR 74. Uh, ACR 74 uh, enjoyed unanimous support in the Assembly Health Committee and was adopted with a voice vote on the Assembly 4. Uh, ACR 74 states that it is the desire of California legislature to establish a viable bu public umbilical cord blood banking system to ensure that our wonderful diverse blood supply um, helps save our wonderful diverse community. Uh, medical research has shown blood re received from umbilical cord blood is rich in stem cells and can be used to treat more than 70 disorders. Many of you know uh, when I was a freshman I carried a bill to set up uh, California's public umbilical cord blood collection program. Uh, I believe at the next hearing we're going to be uh, introducing a bill as well to uh, further establish that program and fully fund it. This resolution um, further states California's need and commitment to establishing umbilical cord blood uh, publicly as well as making the distinction between public and private banking because private banking also plays a role in California's health infrastructure. Um, you also may have read earlier um, that uh, one of my neighbors was the first uh, UCLA cancer patient 20 years ago to receive an umbilical cord blood transplant when he was a toddler and uh, now as a I think just graduated this year from LMU it saved his life we have the ability to save lives but we throw it in the trash as medical waste and it seems pretty silly not to use those stem cells to make cures and I respectfully ask for an I vote on ACR 74 and have witnesses in support. Shannon Smith Crowley, American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. I think one of the um, important things about this resolution is it really helps define some of the differences between private banking and public banking. There's a lot of confusion. We deal with this on a daily basis with our patients and think that this will help the public and the legislature to better understand the benefits of both systems. Yes, I vote. Good afternoon, Michael Mendez with the University of California, also in strong support. Andrew Governor, on behalf of Bay Bio, in strong support. Thank you. Opposition? Uh, we don't have a quorum yet, and we are looking for members. Uh, if, would you like to make a brief closing statement? It's another passionate issue, and thank the chair and committee for all of their support through uh, the discussions on right, cord blood. Be very supportive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Assemblyman Liu, welcome. This is item 9, AB 2153. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and Senators. This bill is a bill designed to address emergency room overcrowding. Uh, it is based on what has been done successfully at hospitals in New York as well as LA USC Hospital here. It would improve ER care by requiring all California hospitals to create and implement a full capacity protocol plan. This plan would require hospitals to assess the results of a crowding scale every four hours and then provide solutions to each stage of the overcrowding scale. The bill is sponsored by the California chapter of the American College of Emergency room physicians and supported by uh, CMA as well as the Cambul California Ambulance Association. And I reserve your question. I vote and I have witnesses here in support. Thank you. 
Witnesses in support. Madam Chair, members, Tim Madden, representing the California Chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians. We are the sponsor of the bill. As you're aware, emergency departments are overcrowded now. They're actually more overcrowded now than they have been in the previous years due to the deteriorating economy and the growing ranks of the uninsured. It's, as a result of these longer wait, uh, more people coming in the emergency department, the wait times to be seen are being extended, as well as the times it takes that once you're in the ER, you're stabilized and ready to be admitted, those times, referred to as boarding times, are increasing as well. We believe this is a simple measure that requires hospitals to assess the level of overcrowding, and then based on that score, they um, implement their full capacity plan. USC LA County Hospital has been using this approach for the past five years, and they've seen dramatic results in the reductions of their wait times of upwards of 35 percent. We appreciate your support in the past on this measure and we respectfully ask your eye vote. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, Carolyn Jenna with the California Medical Association. As stated by the Assemblyman, we are in support of this bill and have supported it in former versions as well. And we do believe that this data is crucial to collect and will help solve a very real problem that's happening in hospitals and emergency rooms throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you. Other witnesses in support? Opposition? Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Sheena Nash. I'm with the Department of Public Health. The Department of Public Health is in opposition to this bill. We do not believe that it will provide any significant improvement to the underlying problem of emergency room overcrowding. Um, the, these measures are being undertaken um, on a case-by-case -case basis by hospitals, and we do believe that this bill is unnecessary and may take emergency room staff away from the very important uh, patient care duties that they have. Thank you. Um, Assemblyman, we don't have a quorum yet. If you would like to address the concerns in a brief closing, it would be great. Sure. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that this full capacity pro plan works. There's no evidence that it doesn't work, and clearly what the Department of Public Health has been doing hasn't been working. So we serve your request, and I vote. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, Ms. Yamada has signed up uh, first, and then we'll have a, a Assemblyman Valines. Welcome. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Thank you very much for this opportunity to present AB 1593, file number three. Thank you. AB 1593 uh, would provide a very limited exemption to the current state moratorium on adult day health centers, would permit two existing adult day health centers that are co-located with veterans homes in Lancaster and Ventura to open up and um, uh, provide services to veterans uh, in a uh, adult day health cent setting. Uh, I know that uh, this bill may sound a little familiar to you because as we presented it last year, uh, proceeded through both houses of the legislature with uh, bipartisan and unanimous support and went to the governor's desk. I believe that uh, in working again with the administration to clarify that these two centers are in existence and I have actually visited one of them. So uh, I will hope to dispel any uh, misconceptions that these uh, adult day health centers are unbuilt. They are in existence and they are ready for business. Do you, do you have pictures? Or <laughs> I'll have to uh, get a YouTube sent up. How's that? Okay. Maybe we'll do that for uh, for any future discussions. But uh, I uh, believe that uh, this is uh, not only uh, a moral imperative to help uh, support our veterans uh, when they're back home, uh, but it certainly will save the state money uh, by being able to draw down federal funds. And so with me, I have a number of wonderful witnesses uh, in support, and I would respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Gabals with the California Association for Adult Day Services. Um, CADS is proud to sponsor this bill that will allow two veteran adult day health care programs to become certified for Medi-Cal payment. Um, it is our understanding that the inability of these two facilities to become certified is one of the unintended consequences of the ongoing ADHC moratorium that has been in place since 2004. Um, these two programs are part of a long-term long care continuum planned for veterans on these two campuses. They are funded by a uh, federal grant from the Veterans Administration, state funds, and public bond funds. And so we would like to see these operating at their uh, optimum levels, which includes treating veterans that are eligible for Medi-Cal. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Gary Passmore with the Congress of California Seniors. As you all probably know, we're very strong supporters of the Adult Day Health Care Program. We uh, commend the author for keeping on this issue, and we urge your I vote. Thank you. Randy Hicks with California Disability Rights. We know a lot of our veterans are going to come back home with some kind of form of disability, and this will help them out and give them services that they deserve and need. Thank you. Thank you. And if everyone else could state their name and that they're in support. Certainly, Madam Chair. Jackie McGrath with the Alzheimer's Association in support. Rebecca, Rebecca Gonzalez, National Association of Social Workers in support. Dana Nickel, Pete Conatine Associates, California Association of County Veteran Service Officers in support. Carol Sewell from the California Commission on Aging in support. Thank you. Anyone else in support? Don Myers, Perky Program Manager, YOLO Adult Day Health Center, President of the California Association of Adult Day Services in support. Thank you. Hi, I'm Debbie Tope. I'm the Chief Program Officer for Rehabilitation Services of Northern California. I'm also a CADS board member and I'm in support. Thank you. Uh, that was the end of support. We're going to stop for a, a moment yes. uh, and establish a quorum. <clears throat> Senator Alquist here. Alquist here. Strickland here. Strickland here. Honested. Yes. Honested here. Cedillo. Cox. Leno. Negretti McLeod here. Negretti McLeod here. here. Pavley. Here. Pavley here. Romero. Thank you. We have five members. We have established the quorum. Thank you. Uh, was there any opposition on this bill? AB 1593. Comments from committee? Move the bill. bill has been moved by uh, our vice chair, uh, uh, Senator Strickland. Uh, should you be taking any amendments down the line, I would love to be added as a co-author. Thank you. Be honored to have you. Thank you. And do you have any succinct closing comments? I simply ask for your aye vote. Uh, it's the right thing to do for veterans and for older adults. Thank you. Thank you. Sen Senator Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Strickland? Aye. Strickland, aye. Honested? Aye. Honested, aye. Cedillo? Cox? Leno? Negretti McLeod? Aye. Negretti McLeod, aye. Pavley? Aye. Pavley, aye. Romero? That bill has five votes. It is out. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. Thank you. And we're keeping all the bills on call to the end, even if they have enough, enough votes to get out. And with that, uh, next we have... Uh, Assemblyman Valines, file item 7, AB 1887. And I want to mention um, that uh, this bill has an urgency attached to it. Yes, ma'am. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, AB 1887 is part of a two-bill package that, as you know, we're, we're tied together and we're co-authors on this measure, too. It's a bipartisan bill. Um, it basically talks about funding for a temporary high-risk pool to provide health care coverage to people with pre-existing conditions. And um, I'm hopeful that we can move the bill through today. It draws down about $761 million over, you know, through 2014 and, and allows us to finally take care of what I hope would be the pre-existing condition problem in California, give us a chance to build something for after 2014. Um, I've got folks who could probably say it better than me that are up here. If that's appropriate, I'd like to turn over to Leslie Clem uh, Cummings, who runs the um, Mr. Mib and go from there. Certainly, and we can either do uh, two witnesses, three minutes each, or uh, three witnesses, two minutes each, but we'll hold, hold closely to the, the time, whichever you choose. Well, can we just make sure this is not opposition, and then... <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm used to, so... <laughs> I think, I think... Yeah, right, right. It looks like, op like uh, support to me. It looks like want. support to me. <laughs> 
Um, Madam Chair and members of the committee, my name is Leslie Cummings. I am the Executive Director of the Managed Risk Medical Insurance Board, which among its programs um, administers the present high risk pool for the state, Mr. MIP. I'm here today speaking on behalf of um, the Schwarzenegger administration, which is in strong support of these two bills, this package of bills that would provide Mr. Mib with the authority and structure to operate a federal temporary high-risk pool in California. Also, the bill, her, uh, the, our board heard these bills today in its meeting and took a position of support at that time. Um, as you already know, these bills are double-joined. One provides the funding structure for the pool, which is this bill, and the other provides Mr. Mib with the substantive authorities and responsibilities to administer it. Um, I'm available to answer any questions that you may have um, about the bills. We just strongly urge your approval and support, and, and we are itching to have the authority that this, these pieces of legislation will provide to actually begin contracting discussions. Thank you. Beth Capel, on behalf of Health Access California, also here today in support of Mr. Valine's bill, and I can understand why he might have thought it was opposition. That's the more <laughs> normal uh, arrangement. But we're pleased to be here in support. We're pleased that it's a bipartisan effort with you, Ms. Madam Chair, and Mr. Valine's, and that we see such broad support behind us. So I'm going to leave the balance of my time to others. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, Gary Passmore with the Congress of California Seniors. Uh, as I said yesterday on your bill, Senator, this is a really important issue for the younger seniors that are prior to getting into Medicare. We really thank Mr. Valines, you, and the governor's office for coming together to implement this important uh, reform. Thanks. Jackie McGrath with the Alzheimer's Association. A very important issue for families living with Alzheimer's, especially diagnosed under age 65. And thank you, Madam Chair, for co-chairing or for co-authoring with the other bills. Charles Bakke with the California Association of Health Plans, also in support of this bill today. Thank you. Nina you know Weather Harwell with AARP California in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Carolyn Jenner with the California Medical Association, also in strong support of the bill. Our member physicians just uh, two years ago in our 2008 House of Delegates did reaffirm standing CMA policy that we do support access to high-risk pools as a means of coverage for these individuals who really have no other option. So we thank Mr. Valines for his leadership on this issue. Thank you, Liz Helms. Liz Helms with the California Chronic Care Coalition. Very important bill to us, too. So we thank you both for spearheading these bills. Very, very strong support. Kristen Hare, California Academy of Family Physicians, also in support. Mr. Chair. Randy Hicks of California for Disability Rights in strong support. Stephen Lindsay, California Association of Health Underwriters in strong support. Thank you. David Vandergriff with the California Hospital Association in support. Thank you. And Chick with HealthNet in support. Thank you. Thank you. Opposition? We'll see there, Mr. Valines. It's no line, no line. Uh, comments from committee? <coughs> Senator Onestad. Question uh, to uh, the representative from Mr. Mip. It's been difficult for your agency to do its job with its present uh, financial situation um, and um, we're well aware of the problems that you've had in trying to provide the, an adequate level of services um, over the last few years. What makes the board think that in light of everything that I've heard, um, the program is already, the program we're contemplating today is already underfunded. The projections are severely underfunded for the next three years. How does Mr. Mip think that it can take on that responsibility when it's having trouble taking on the responsibilities it presently has? Senator Onestat, um, we, I, I would um, say that I don't think that we have trouble taking on the responsibilities that we have. What we have is an underfunded program. Um, and so we would never argue that the program that we have for medically uninsurable people in California is sufficient or adequate. I don't think it is. What this 
um, federal temporary high risk pool provides is the opportunity for something that would provide comprehensive benefits without an annual benefit cap at what we believe to be lower rates so that it will be um, much more useful for for Californians. But, it, but is not the $761 million going to come to California uh, patients anyway? Isn't is he, what we're talking about here is who's going to control that money? Mm -hmm. Well, we think that the argument for the state working to bring up the program as opposed to relying on the federal government is a better idea for several reasons. One, we have experience doing this and they don't. Two, we think state government is more responsive to the people than federal government. We will be more, it will be much more possible for us to make any modifications that we think are necessary as time goes on and to have a real sense of what is going on with the, po with the population of Californians that are enrolled in this, in this coverage and to be mindful of California markets as opposed to a broad based, a broad brush approach which the federal government will have to turn to. And yet two years from now, when the feds say we have no more money, and now you have the responsibility of providing the services, what is your contingency plan? Sadly, um, we are one of the few high-risk pools in the country that have experience running waiting lists. We know how to do that. We, we do it right now. The other high-risk pools in the country are very consternated about this idea um, of the possibility of running out of money because they have never had to do that. But as a function of our funding, we've had to do it for the bulk of the time of the program. So I'm afraid that's something... So what you're saying is your contingency plan is longer waiting lists. Our contingency plan is if we have insufficient federal funds that yes, we would implement waiting lists. And however... If you were not as they, as would the, they. Yeah, well, I'm going to say, however, if the state of California were not in control of these funds, if we voted this bill down and you did not have that responsibility and California did not have that responsibility, then there would be no California waiting list. It would be a federal problem. There would be a waiting list with Californians on it. Or, you know, I mean, the other thing that people will say and advocates will, I'm sure, say um, in response to our conversation here is that our first approach should be to go and, um, and lobby the federal government to get additional funding, which we would do. We would totally do that. But at the end of the day, California, if there's not sufficient funding, and I myself am not sure about that because we don't know what the take-up is going to be for this product. We really don't. I have 7,100 slots in Mr. MIP right now, and we don't have a waiting list um, because the product is not that, that desirable to people, but as people come in, as people go out, we fill their slots. As people go out, we fill their slots. I don't know what the demand is going to be for this product. But whatever it is, I think we are better able to take into account what Californians need in this state, respond via our market in California, and do everything we can to um, control costs in such a way that they will not end up being on a waiting list. But from our standpoint, and I won't be here two years from now, but from our standpoint, <clears throat> this is surely going to increase hundreds of millions of dollars. This one program alone, uh, in budget pressure three years from now, if we are in, indeed in control of this program, wouldn't it be better to let the federal government be responsible for funding and controlling the program until adequate funds are made so that we're not inheriting uh, not only the program but also the financial liability when the feds bow out? Well, the feds are not bowing out. What is happening is that in 2014, a whole array of changes occur in the healthcare marketplace and, and, and in healthcare coverage. So. They're not buying out. They will be there. They will be there with, with expanded subsidized coverage for Medicaid, subsidized coverage for, uh, for people via tax credits. There is a transition that will have to happen of the people in this pool into the regular marketplace. What, what, what becomes, it's certainly not a regular marketplace now, but what becomes a regular marketplace in 2014.
if I could just make one point on, on that, and, and uh, I, I know Senator John said that we uh, probably disagree on this, but the way I look at it is that we have the opportunity to have Mr. Mib, which is excellent, uh, be in charge of this, and uh, in, in terms of the state being financially in danger down the line, uh, my complimentary bill uh, assures that it's going to be paid for by the feds, and that if it's not, then, then we're not able to do it. So the choice seems to be... Um, do we want to have some control and, and have some uh, agency that is known for being stellar and for doing a great job in this area? Um, and in doing it that way, uh, have the complementary bill that protects our general fund, or do we just want to give it to the feds t to do? Because uh, they may not want to do it exactly the way we may wish to, but uh, that's my perspective anyway. Are there other comments? Uh, similar member lines. Well, I, would, I would just close, close with an address. Yeah, exactly. And I would say that the questions are very good questions. I mean, it's something we've all had to wrestle with, um, and I think you just addressed some of the main points. But I would just make a couple of basic things in closing that, you know, the cost for these individuals is it's a relative term. It's either a federal cost or a state cost, but it's a cost. And these are people. And we have an opportunity to, I think, use Mr. Mib, which has been a fantastic program that is underfunded. And it could be again in three years. My hope would be, and I won't be here either, Mr. Anastad, but in three years, my hope would be that we would have found a way to sort of move forward and find a way to fund this across the country. Because I think there's one thing we can all agree on, you know, both houses, all committees, and I think people in the audience in general, everybody. The only folks that can't get health care are those with that pre-existing condition, and that's that child born. It's the person working who loses a job, and right now that's a, re that's a reality, who all of a sudden loses their care, develops a condition, can't get it. It's a senior. Um, we have a chance to, to fix that with a program we know that works here in California with our tax dollars. Those are our tax dollars that we send off, and it's our chance to use them to come back. There will be problems in, in three years, but hopefully we can get those worked out. But um, I'm really excited to think that we might have a chance to take what I think is the shining star of, of reform and say that we're going to take care of those that simply can't get the insurance. Um, that's what we're talking about. And so I think this is a first step towards that. And I, and I just believe, I guess I'd close with this last thought, I think that had the country or California dealt with pre-existing individuals first, we had our health care debate four years ago now, that we would be in a completely different position talking about the next steps as opposed to still being at baby steps. And, and that's something we can all agree on and build from. So I would just ask your I vote. I appreciate the patience of the committee and um, look forward to hopefully working on this issue as we move on. Thank you very much. We need a motion. So moved. So moved by Senator Negrini McLeod. Senator Alquist. Aye. Alquist, aye. Strickland? No. Strickland, no. Honested? No. Honested, no. Cedillo? Cox? Leno? Negretti McLeod? Aye. Negretti McLeod, aye. Pavley? Romero? It's AB 1887. Mr. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That bill has three eye votes, uh, two no votes, and it is on call. All the bills will be on call. Okay, great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Let's do the consent calendar. Plus we also heard from the other bills. Pardon me? Plus we also heard by court teams. Plus we can do uh, Let's do the uh, consent calendar first, <coughs> which is uh, item 5, AB 1783, Hayashi, and item 12, AB 2635, Portentino. Senator Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Strickland? Aye. Strickland, aye. Honested? Honested, aye. Cedillo? 
Cox, Leno, Negretti McLeod, Negretti McLeod, I, Pavley, Romero. I. Romero, I. Uh, while we're waiting for an author and, um, and uh, more members, why don't we quickly go through the bills that we've done? We will continue to hold the roll open. But uh, oh, here we have a. First, we will do Assemblyman Nava. Yes, thank you. Yes, and this is item 10, AB 2496. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, and I apologize um, for the uh, delay. I was in the uh, Senate Banking Committee. This is on Assembly Bill 2496, the um, Tobacco Damages of Recovery Act. Uh, Madam Chair and members, this bill will improve California's statutes regarding the Tobacco Master Settlement Agreement and related statutes. In 1998, the Attorney General of California and 45 other states agreed to settle more than 40 pending lawsuits with the nation's four major tobacco companies. The suits were brought to recover the public costs of treating smoking and related illnesses. The settlement is known as the Master Settlement Agreement or the MSA. Under the MSA, the state is required <coughs> to set up statutes to diligently enforce its smaller non-participating manufacturers, also referred to as M NPMs, and enforce an escrow statute. Since 1998, NPMs, mostly foreign companies, have figured out how to get around these escrow payments. This bill will close those loopholes. There is a risk that if California fails to maintain diligent enforcement, the participating manufacturers will be able to argue that California is not diligently enforcing against the NPMs and can cause that and can use that to support a reduction in their payments made to the state under the MSA. Recently, Virginia and four other states have enhanced their NPM enforcement legislation, closing loopholes that have allowed NPMs to evade escrow payments, thereby raising the bar on the standard for diligent enforcement against the NPMs. This bill is sponsored by the California Department of Justice. It is supported by the American Lung Association and has received bipartisan support uh, in every vote so far. I would respectfully ask for an I vote. And what I'd like to, to say before we go to uh, witnesses' support, uh, we only have one other author, and that's Assemblyman Fuhr. So it would be really great if Assemblyman Fuhr could come to our Senate Health Committee. Thank you. And I could I contribute to that. Mr. Fuhr was right behind me in banking. Okay. So, so he's presenting now. Okay. I understand it's that kind of day, yes. Thank you. Okay. Witnesses and support. Uh, my name is Mark LaForest. I'm the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Attorney General's Office. We're the supporter of this measure. We've worked uh, very hard with the stakeholders to get the language to uh, where it should be. Uh, it's a good bill. We believe that from the Health Committee's perspective, the end result of this should be that there will be fewer uh, Cheap, cheap cigarettes on the market, frankly, uh, that are as a result of missed escrow and tax payments. Uh, and that's our enforcement perspective. With me is Bill Suhu from the Tobacco Enforcement Unit of our office to ask and answer any questions that you may have about the bill. Thank you. I ask for your I vote. I don't believe there's opposition, but. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in support? Uh, is there opposition? Comments from committee? Is there a motion on the bill? So uh, moved by Senator Negretti McLeod. A succinct close? I'd ask for an aye vote. That's a good one. Thank you. Senator Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Strickland? No. Strickland, no. Honested? No. Honested, no. Cedillo? Cox? Leno? Negretti McLeod? Aye. Negretti McLeod, aye. Pavley? Aye. Pavley, aye. Romero? Aye. Romero, aye. That bill has four votes. It needs one more vote. It will be on call. Thank you. Thank you very much. We understand Assemblyman Fuhr is presenting another committee, and hopefully he will be here, here shortly. And then at that point, uh, we will also need uh, Senator Cedillo and Senator uh, Leno. Madam Chair, could you open the roll on this item? Certainly. And at this point, we will uh, open the roll on the items uh, we have already discussed. It will be going order? Yes. Okay. So we first will do item, and even when we take the vote, we will still continue to keep the bills on call. Okay, file item two, AB113, Portentino. Senator Alquist? Oh, we have a move. We need a motion. Oh, yes, we need a motion on these. Okay. It's been moved by Senator Negretti McLeod. Aye. Alquist, aye. Strickland? Aye. Strickland, aye. Honested? Aye. Honested, aye. Cedillo? Cox? Leno, Negretti McLeod, Negretti McLeod, aye. Pavley, aye. Pavley, aye. Romero, aye. Romero, aye. 
it's got six. And that was with the amendment. That has six votes, which is enough to get up, but we will keep it on call for other members to add on. The next item would be file item three, uh, AB 1593. We need a motion. No, we have a motion on that one. We have a motion on that one. Okay, call for the vote, please. Um, Senator Romero. Aye. Romero, aye. It's got six. It has six votes. We will keep that on call. What's next? Seven. Item seven. Oh, yes, file item 7, uh, AB 1887. This is an urgency measure. Uh, Assemblyman Belines. Senator Cedillo, Cox, Leno, Pavley. Aye. Pavley, I. Romero. Aye. Romero, I. That bill has four votes. It will continue to be on call. Item 9, item nine uh, AB 2153 by Assemblyman Liu. Needs a motion. Needs a motion. So moved. so moved by Senator Grady McLeod. Senator Alquist. Aye. Alquist, aye. Strickland. Aye. Strickland, aye. Honested. No. Honested, no. Cedillo. Cox. Leno. Negretti McLeod. Aye. Negretti McLeod, aye. Pavley. Aye. Pavley, aye. Romero. Aye. Romero, aye. That bill has five votes, which is enough to get up, but we will hold it, keep, continue to, to keep it on call. Oh, 10, sorry. I'm trying to take this. It'll be 13. And we've done, yeah. you've done 10? We, we did 10. We Item. Oh, yeah. yeah. She has done 10. Yeah. So 13. The consent calendar. Okay. Uh, we did the consent calendar. Would it, uh, anyone like to add on to the consent? Item 13. Okay. Let's do the consent calendar, which was item mm -hmm. 5 and item 12. Senator Cedillo, Cox, Leno, Pavley. Aye. Pavley, aye. It's got six. You voted on that. Okay. And item 13. The ACR. Item 13, ACR 74, but Portentino. <coughs> Needs a motion. So moved. So moved by the two Senator <laughs> Gloria's here. Okay. <laughs> Senator Alquist. Aye. Alquist, aye. Strickland. Aye. Strickland, aye. Honested. The ACR. 13. Honested, aye. aye. Cedillo. Cox. Leno, Negretti McLeod. Aye. Negretti McLeod, aye. Pavley. Aye. Pavley, aye. Romero. Aye. Romero, aye. It's got six. That has six, enough to get up, but we will keep it on call. We are waiting for Assemblyman Fuhr, who has two bills, and that will be it. It was, uh, I mentioned at the beginning, the bills that were put over, including the chessboard bill. Okay. And Blumenfield. And uh, several were put over, actually. I'll say it again. Um, uh, file, the ones put over were file item four, file item, and file item six by the authors, and then I asked that the Mendoza bill be put over. Okay. So those three bills were put over. And are we going to do a vote? No, he put that over. Uh, Senator DeSaunier put over uh, the vote only. So next week will be very busy. Very busy. <laughs> so enjoy today. Um, yes, sir. Yes, and... Um, it doesn't die. It's no. just being put over the second time. If it fails the vote, the it dies. And that's in our committee rules. I checked with the desk. Yeah, also. I checked oh. the rules on that. I checked with the desk earlier. Ms. Thomas said she checked with the desk on this. Uh, but if you want to check, we can look at it again. Okay. <laughs> Assemblyman, if you're welcome. And you have two items? I do. If I could do AB 2042 first, please. That would be item 8, yes. Thank you very much. I want to keep in with, with the theme of enjoying the rest of the day. This bill will be you right like in the bullseye okay, of that. <laughs> um, yeah, so first I'd like to begin by accepting the technical amendments that were suggested in the committee analysis. Thank you very much. Um, and this is going to be a brief presentation because it's a straightforward issue. Uh, we have seen in recent months uh, the possibility of multiple rate increases in the individual health insurance market. What does that mean? That means in a time of tremendous economic uncertainty, 
certainty that policyholders are faced with the prospect of not being able to plan properly, having to prioritize what do we pay, food or health insurance every month. It's really important to provide some stability for households that are coming to grips with the economically difficult times we're facing. So what this bill says is that health insurers can raise rates once in a 12-month period. Uh, and the, uh, I guess fundamentally, the question for the, the committee is, isn't that enough time, enough of an increase in one year, one time, and isn't it important to maintain, to maintain stability for people who are struggling to put bread on the table every month? And so having said that, again, this pertains to the individual market, I would urge an I vote. Beth Capel, on behalf of Health Access California, we're pleased to be the sponsors of this measure that would, as Mr. Fuhrer indicated, provide predictability for consumers. We have, um, as the bills progressed, worked with the opposition and attempted to take those amendments which we thought were um, reasonable protections for consumers. Um, you will hear from the opposition that many of them currently raise your premiums twice a year, once because health care costs are going up and once for your birthday. And if there's anything I can predict about the next 12 months, it's that I'm going to get older. Um, and so we would think that uh, they would be able to predict that most of us will get older over the course of the year and plan ahead to only raise rates once a year instead of giving us, um, I'm not quite sure if it's a lump of coal you get, would get for your birthday, but some, some unpleasant present for your birthday. So that kind of predictability seems like a very fair thing to do for consumers, both in terms of rates and benefits. Thank you. Gary Passmore, Congress of California, seniors, and we're strongly in support of this legislation. On, on that point, uh, Senator Biddy, you'll wait? wait. Okay, sure. thank okay. you. Randy Hicks with California Alliance for Retired Americans and strong support. <coughs> is there more opposition? And there is a question from Senator Grady McLeod for the support. Yes. Support. Do you want, do you want to ask a question of support or opposition? Sure. I, want, I want to ask a question. Yes, please. The comment one on page seven of the analysis has a, uh, uh, brings up a point about does this bill also uh, not allow the insurance companies to lower rates? Would it, would it give them an inability to lower rates? The bill at the moment says that they can't alter rates. Okay, does, uh, so does that mean they can't go, well, you would prefer that they not go up, but does that mean that they can't alter them down? Yeah, the bill currently says alter rates. So which but, but, means but, that's right, but we're, but we're continuing to be open to the possibility of fashioning language that would allow in some circumstances rates to decline. For example, if an alternative less expensive medication were available. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, because that's Opposition. I'm, I'm still supporting. You're still supporting. <laughs> Madam okay. Chair, I'm sorry. I was slow to move to the mic. Seth Bramble on behalf of the California yes. Teachers Association and in support. Thank you. Opposition. Madam Chair, Stephen Lindsay with the California Association of Health Underwriters. Um, I would like to first. I'd like to thank the author for taking the amendments that he has taken. He addressed a number of concerns that we raised in the first policy committee. Um, however, we find ourselves in a, in a, still in an, in an opposed and less amended position. And um, I want to go back and talk some, somewhat about uh, a, a point that Beth brought up: that folks get older. The way the carriers currently raise premiums for age in the individual marketplace is either on a five-year or a 10-year age bracket. So they don't go up every year. There are, there are slots of, of age brackets. So a person only faces an age increase every five or 10 years, depending upon which carrier you are. And what I hear from my clients, because I am a health insurance agent, and I'm the one who has to deliver these rate increases, I, I always talk to my clients in the year in which they are going to get a rate increase based on age. And what happens is, is if you save it till the end of the year, the premium the increase that they get can be substantially higher. And, and we believe it's a better protection for our clients if the carriers are allowed to do an age 
rating increase on an interim period throughout uh, the year in which they're actually going to turn an age an age, uh, <coughs> older. Um, we'd be more than happy to, to to talk with the author about keeping it to you know to five years or ten years or or some form thereof. But my clients tell me that they would prefer to get it that way rather than all at once at the end. And Mr. Lindsay. Um do you hand your clients a list or do you email them a table, a chart that says at age 40, 45, 50, 55, it'll go up X amount of dollars or X percent? Do they know what to anticipate? Um, let's see. The, the, the amount that it goes up is, is, is determined on an annual basis based on what the trend is for that year. So, so you may have had four years of increases based on the, on the actual product that they originally bought, so that might be different. But, but yes, I give my, my clients those when I sell them the product, and then I always call them the year in which they're going to have an age change and say, you have an age change and coming. say happy birthday. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some would say that's a, that's a chance to market more products. but. <laughs> so, so when I turn 66 at the end of August, it's going to be an age change for me? Yes, <laughs> yes, it will be. You will no longer be able to get individual health insurance. <laughs> it just um, gets better and better, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> You'll be on Medicare. Um, so, um, so we would, my clients, and then so I notify my clients that there's an age change coming so they're not surprised when it comes in the mail and tell them what month is going to come so that there's no surprises for them. And, and so we believe that, that this keeps more people insured by reducing the rate shock they get when you add, especially in the older ages, when you add, when somebody goes from 59 to 60, and having just passed that. Thank you. Why don't we uh, let the other witnesses in opposition all testify, and then I think we'll probably have a robust discussion. Do you have a, uh, for the opposition, or for the author, or? For the author. For the author, would you like to ask now? If I could. Yes, sure. go right ahead. Um, I share the concern of Senator Negrete McLeod, and so I want to understand the intent of the bill. Okay, you're using the language rate change. I I would take it that the concern is about increasing rates. Yes. Okay, but the language in the bill does, in a sense, say that we would then be essentially prohibiting a decrease in the rate, which I'm not comfortable in supporting. I'm wondering if what language or amendment can you give us today that would say, that would really alter the language of plan of rate altering to say this is specifically about rate increases? Because I don't think you want to say you want to prohibit rate decreases. I certainly don't. Yeah. And, and I need some kind of, I need an amendment to say that it clarify that this is about altering to increase as opposed to altering to decrease, which I would favor. Yes. A, a couple things. I, I have a comment, and I think um, that our sponsor also has a comment to make on this. Uh, first, figuring out language that pertains to rate decreases is more complicated than it seems, and we've been working on this. Here's the complication, that sometimes rate decreases, including the offers of discounts, have been shown to disadvantage low-income people in particular. There are certain kinds of discounts that might pertain to, I don't know, enrollment in a gym, for example, uh, that are more readily available to some people than others. So we've been wrestling with how to achieve the goal that Senator Negrete McLeod and, and you, Senator Rara, have, have articulated, because we share the goal, while at the same time not opening the door to what are potentially economically discriminatory means by which some people's rates might be lowered and those not, might not be available to others. Share the goal. Are still working on this issue. Don't uh, we believe very strongly that your point is well taken? But the art of figuring out the precise language is something we haven't achieved yet. And I understand that, but that's an issue we face in every bill. I mean, at a certain point, we're in the second house now. Mm -hmm. This is the final policy committee. What's the outcome of the wrestling match? So I, I guess what I would want is. You know, will you take an amendment that clarifies, and you can work with the committee, you can keep wrestling, fine with me, but are you willing to, I'm asking, are you willing to take an amendment to clarify that this bill pertains to rate increases 
and is either silent or prohibits, yeah. and I would prefer prohibit, mm -hmm. rate deal. I just feel uncomfortable right. to say that I'm going to prohibit an insurer no. who might do the right thing and say we're actually overcharging our customers, and we're going to, on your birthday, we're going to decrease your rate. Think Beth wants to say one quick thing, and sure. then I'll respond to your question. Thank you for the question. Um, the... Here's the challenge. Rate decreases usually come with decreases in benefits or other increases. This is one of, as we've struggled in this committee with this issue over the years, I think the committee has heard a lot of testimony about how there is, um, I'd call mix, there's a lot of churning in the individual market and what has a rate in decrease usually goes along with higher cost sharing or reduced or limited benefits. So we certainly would not oppose the opportunity to have a reduced premium so long as that was a reduced premium for the same benefits and the same cost sharing. And because all of the discussion has been about creating things either moving the other pieces of the puzzle or about offering discounts, on, for example, on wellness incentives where there's a very robust academic literature that indicates that among the people who are harmed by that are people over 50, people who are low income, women working in low wage jobs, and the like. And so we have a real resistance, as a matter of fact, we would oppose, um, offering discounts for wellness incentives. So, but, but, but the, but the basic, issues, I think. The basic yeah. issue that you've raised, we're for reducing rates, so long as it's not done by cutting benefits or increasing cost sharing. Well, I, I, let, let me say that uh, I um, I think I can predict where we're headed, which is uh, an attempt to fashion language that achieves the goal that was just stated, I think is a common goal that's shared by the two people who questioned, the two senators who raised this issue, which is no one wants to see a reduction in benefits in exchange for reduction in rates. Uh, no one wants to see potentially discriminatory practices put in place that decrease rates for some people based essentially on income but not on others. Find the language that achieves the goal of assuring that rates can be decreased without having those negative consequences, and we're there. Is that a fair statement where we are? Well, what I would like to do, if this is all right, both with uh, Senator Romero and Senator Negretti McLeod, because I had some of, as the author and Ms. Capel know, I had some of the same thoughts, but I wanted to see the sense of the committee. What I suggest is that we hear all the testimony and then have you work on amendments and that next week we bring it back for vote only. And that at that Sounds point good. we see exactly what you have done. I'm sure that it could be written in a way that says that, that rates could be lowered uh, as long as benefits are not decreased, something yeah. to that effect. I, appreci I would appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. And then we can all work together. So we're on opposition. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Nick Luizos is with the California Association of Health Plans. Uh, we actually uh, are opposed to the bill unless it is amended to allow the industry greater flexibility to comply. Um, I think what the intent uh, or one of the um, intentions of the author here is to uh, address a perceived uh, arbitrary nature of any rate modifications for enrollees. Um, just, uh, you know, two issues on that front. Um, one, individual contracts um, with with, uh, between enrollees and health plans clearly speci specify when um, well, first, that, that modifications can be made to the policy and when those modifications can be made. And number two, we actually have developed a series of amendments that we believe would address um, the concern of the author. However, at this time, those amendments have not been taken. One of those was the uh, greater flexibility on the uh, switching of the age bands, um, which has been discussed earlier in committee. Um, unfortunately, the bill does not address those amendments, and therefore we're still opposed to the bill. Thank you. Are you, con uh, Mr. Luis, are you continuing to work with the author on on the age ban, et cetera? I mean, uh, another way to look at this is that that instead of doing it every five years, where it's a big jump, or every ten years, that it's a, a very tiny increment every year. Or I mean, there's different ways to look at it, and I would just appreciate if you could thoroughly flesh this out. Yes, of course, and, and Madam Chair, if I might also point out that 
the organizations that testified in favor of the bill include organizations whose role is to advocate on behalf of senior citizens who are advocating for the bill in this form because they believe it's to their benefit that it be done this way. Having said that, we have had a very constructive and long-going discussion with opponents regarding amendments to the bill and are always open to further conversations. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, Dan Chick with HealthNet. We are opposed as well, primarily for the age ban issue that's bef uh, been discussed already. As far as uh, limiting arbitrary changes throughout the year, there are instances when benefits can go up and can go down, as would premiums. And uh, for those reasons, we are opposed. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, members, Manolo Platine, Blue Shield of California. For the reasons explained by my colleagues, we are also in opposition. Jason Gappar with the Association of California Life and Health Insurance Companies in opposition. Thank you. Are there any other comments from uh, committee members? Then what we will do um, before we uh, allow uh, Assemblyman Fear to close is to say that I think there's been a good discussion. A lot of good questions have been raised. I think some suggestions that could make this a better bill and that uh, next week uh, we will do a, a vote only, no discussion. I mean, even at our ages, we all have great memories, and we will remember what we said <laughs> today. We will remember next week. But if you would like to make a, a brief close or a, and touch on any... No, a, a, exceptionally brief, if I might, Madam Chair. Um, just to recapitulate where I think we are, uh, in the course of the next few days, We'll work with your committee staff to construct an amendment that enables rates to be decreased more than once during a year's period of time, uh, as long as two factors remain true. One, that the benefits that are afforded to the policyholder don't decrease as well, and two, as long as this is done in a way that does not discriminate on the basis of income in practical terms, which I don't think anybody wants, least of all the proponents of the change. Fair? Thank you very much. But, pardon me? No. Okay. All right. We'll work with you. We want you should be happy. That's the theme of the day. And, and, and we want that we'd be happy to. Yeah. So thank you very much. And you have another bill. I do. Let's see. This is item 11. The next one, item 11, AB 2555. Yes. And I would suggest that shortly we will need uh, Senator Leno and Senator <coughs> Cedillo. And also, we are very sorry that Senator C Cox is not with us today. Yes, I'm sure we all, all wish him well. <laughs> so, Mr. Nielsen is actually, if he's, he's here, he's he here is on going this to bill. testify on this bill. Yeah. 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 He's on his way, right? Oh, he's on his uh, way. Okay. He was here. He was here. In okay. fact, I saw him sitting there, and, and so we. Uh, we, we talked with him and uh, just wanted to be sure. Yes, I'm sure he'll be right back. Yes, I'm sure he'll be right back. Okay. If, if I might begin, um, in fact, Mr. Nielsen's presence is indicative of the bipartisanship that's been the hallmark of this legislation so far. Um, here's our goal. Uh, we have a long-term care ombudsman program, which is the only program of its kind in the state to assure that nursing home residents are not abused or neglected and have some intervention when their lives are imperiled. A couple years ago, the governor vetoed the general fund allocation to the ombudsman program. That threatened the viability of the program. So last year, we all worked together as a team to put in place a, an amount of money, a million six, from a federal citation account, penalties that nursing homes incur, and devote that money, devoted that money to the ombudsman program. That enabled the program to sustain itself for one year. Now, of course, our general fund is in even worse condition than it was previously. We've been working for months to try to find a meaningful long term term alternative to these one-term infusions of money. There's not one yet. There's some potential at the federal level, at the state level, but not yet. So this bill, this bipartisan bill that has had no no vote so far on its, on its uh, travels, uh, would say we'll take a million six from a state citation account that has much more money than that in it, a reserve of well over $4 million, and enable this program, this lifeline program, to stay in place for another year as we work at the federal and state levels to find a viable long-term alternative because we cannot leave these nursing home patients vulnerable as they are without the this protection. And last year, in the Assembly Committee on this issue, we heard testimony that literally it could well be that lives were
were lost because of the danger. Last thing I'll say, this is an urgency measure. It needs to continue to have the bipartisan support that it's had because the program will run out of the money we allocated at the end of this month. With all that, I urge a strong I bipartisan vote on this issue so we can protect the most vulnerable among us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And we'll have uh, two witnesses, three minutes each, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Jackie McGrath with the Alzheimer's Association. Um, obviously, Mr. Fuhr has done an excellent job uh, describing the mechanics of the bill to you. I just want to say a word about the residents who are so dependent on the long-term care ombudsman. About... Um, a third, two thirds of the residents or a third of the residents in nursing homes are there for the long term. They're not there for rehab. They don't go home again. They may be there for weeks, months, and even years. They are among the frailest. About 70% of them do have dementia or Alzheimer's. Uh, many of them have family members who do not live locally. No one looking in on them. The long term care ombudsman is their advocate. Their knowledge of the law, they're frequently in the facility. I would just urge you, um, Mr. Nielsen and Mr. Fuhrer have come up with a creative, non-general fund solution one more year um, to, to cover this program, and we will find a long-term funding solution. So I urge your I vote. Thank, Thank you. you. And next we'll have Assemblyman Senator Nielsen. Oh, Madam <laughs> Chair and honorable members of the committee, thank you for your indulgence. I'm Got to rush right back to conference committee, but I would like to appeal to you. Uh, I go way back with this. It was called originally the Nielsen Mello Nursing Home Reform Act in somewhere in the 1980s, which created, among other things, the ombudsman. And I've watched that evolve over the years to be a very successful thing. I think the most recent witness was commenting on one aspect of the problem solving, the litigation prevention uh, thing. It, it, it certainly does help um, the, the residents. In a, in a great way and gives them a, a very effective voice, uh, but not an antagonistic one. It, it's always, uh, I, I've been surprised at how much problem solving has occurred and how much comfort that the families find in knowing that there is that voice. Uh, and this is a creative way. Uh, it is <clears throat> obviously going to have to be a temporary thing. There will be other things ahead, but I would entreat the committee to favorably consider the bill. Thank you, and thank you for taking time from conference. I, I have a passion, Madam Chair, so thank you for letting me yes. come down and say something. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, I am Tippi Irwin, Executive Director of Ombudsman Services of San Mateo County, and I'm also a member of the board of the California Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association. The local ombudsman programs in the state of California provide vital advocacy for uh, vital advocacy services for 290,000 residents in 9,300 facilities across the state. There are currently 967 state-certified volunteer ombudsmen who provide tens of thousands of drop-in visits to facilities across the state each year. They monitor for quality of care and quality of life. In our past complete fiscal year, our ombudsman investigated and closed f over 43,000 complaints and were able to bring resolution or partial resolution to 73% of those. The cut in state funding in, in 2008 led to the layoff of 50% of state um, of uh, ombudsman staff in the local programs across the state. This in turn led to the drop off of our ability to provide regular and ongoing presence in the facilities. The net result has been also a drop result, a drop in, in a 40% drop in, um, in the complaints that have been passed on to licensing. I would suggest that this drop is not a result of a miraculous improvement in quality of care and quality of life that's taken place in the facilities, but rather it's a result of the lack of ombudsman presence, presence as, an ongoing, uh, as, a, as an ongoing thing in the, in the facilities. Abuse and neglect is going unreported. Take, for example, the case of an 87-year-old demented woman in a facility whose daughter arrived to visit and discovered that her mother had been sexually assaulted the night before. No report had been made to the police, no report had been made to the licensing body, and no report had been made to the ombudsman. The, had the daughter not taken it upon herself and reported it to Channel 7 News, this incident would have just been passed over as though it had never happened. And my contention is that that was because ombudsmen were not an ongoing presence in the facilities. 
While the presence of the Ombudsman cannot present all abuse from happening, our presence can help provide a safety net for reporting and ensuring the same thing does not recur. We are the front line, the first responders when it comes down to abuse and neglect in the long-term care facilities across the state. And as such, our presence is critical in the health and safety of the residents. And if you could, oh, you were done. That was perfect. Thank you very much. If everyone else could just state their name and that they are in support. Gary Passmore, Congress of California Seniors, and we are proud to support a champion of this program. Great. Nina Weiler Hartwell with AARP California in strong support of this bill. Thank you. Randy Hicks of California Alliance for Retired Americans in strong support. Senior Senator Lola Young with the California Senior Legislature in strong support of this measure. Thank you. Carol Sewell from the California Commission on Aging in support. Thank you. Martha, Flam Martha Flammer representing the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors. Thank Assemblymember Fuhrer for this effort in support. Thank you. Cecilia McGee, uh, Golden Ages for Progress from Stanislaus County. We strongly support this bill. Matthew Pella from Tuolumne County, an ombudsman and a uh, member of the Commission on Aging, and I'd like to voice my strong support and to pass along the support of the Board of Supervisors thank of Tuolumne County. Thank you very much. <laughs> Linda Sharp with The Gap from Modesto, California. Strong support Thank for this you. bill. While one person speaking, the other can sit down at the other chair so we can move a little more quickly, please. My name is Dominga Hernandez, and I'm from uh, Calaveras County with Golden Ages for Progress, and we support this bill. Thank you. Hello, I'm Simona Rios, and I represent the Diocese of Stockton in very strong support of this bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm... Right. We have three mics, so please, yes, just... <laughs> Hi, I'm Molly Davies. I'm the program director for the Wise and Healthy Aging Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program that serves the city and county of Los Angeles. And we are in so strong support of this bill and urge, respectfully urge your I vote. Thank you. Thank you. Just say your name and that you're in support, please. I'm Linda Robinson, Long-Term Care Ombudsman Coordinator for Santa Cruz, San Benito County, is also representing Advocacy, Inc. in strong support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wanda Hale, Long-Term Care Ombudsman, Catholic Charities, Santa Cruz <coughs> County, in Thank strong you. support. Thank you. Olivia Garcia, go ahead. <laughs> Olivia Garcia, Catholic Charities Long Term Care Ombudsman Program, in strong support for this. Thank bill. you. Uh, my name is Diane Teco, and I'm an ombudsman for Contra Costa County, and we are strongly in support of this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Doreen Hopkins, the Contra Costa County Ombudsman Services, and we support this bill. Thank, Thank you. you. Anna Maitland, Director of Ombudsman Services of Contra Costa, in strong support of this bill. Our services are free and confidential to all of our residents. And, so it's and, a good, and good deal. Thank you. Yeah. Next. Right. I'm Nancy O'Keefe, Ombudsman Services of Contra Costa. I strongly support this bill. Thank you. I mean, <clears throat> Benson Nadal, I direct the Ombudsman Program in San Francisco, and I'm presently the president of the Long-Term Care Ombudsman Association. And you're in support. I'm absolutely in support. Wonderful, thank and you. And thank Next. you for all of your support. <laughs> I'm Shirley Murray. I'm president of the Board of Directors of Contra Costa County, and I strongly support your thank you. help. Thank you. Nicole Wardleman on behalf of the Ventura County Board of Supervisors and the City and County of San Francisco in support. Thank you. Madam Chair, Daryl Kelch with the California Association of Area Agencies on Aging. <coughs> we have mandated responsibility for oversight. And, and thank you very much. Is there opposition? There is opposition. Madam Chair, members, Dave Helmsen on behalf of the California Association of Health Facilities and start out by appreciating the author's uh, intent here and also appreciating the role of the ombudsman in long-term care. We don't go as far as to say that they're the only foil between patient neglect and abuse in our facilities. We have highly trained health professionals, administrators, they're all mandated reporters criminally under abuse and neglect and studies show pretty conclusively that most of that happens in the community, not in our facilities, thankfully. That 
that being said, our opposition to the bill is based on the funding source, and we did, we've not believed from the beginning that this was an adequate funding source for the program, and uh, for reasons that we're having some budget problems now and trying to make the accounts line up, I think that's a valid problem. Uh, just for the committee's information, though, we have put a, another suggestion on the table in the budget process that you use some of the money that will be saved from the nursing home reimbursement system as a, uh, a stopgap measure here at least, and uh, believe that that's a much better and uh, more stable funding source in the long run. Lord knows the budget is not a precise process right now. However, I think that out of that discussion, we will probably evolve a, a better funding source, and I can certainly understand why the Assemblyman would want to continue to move this bill given the, the imprecision of the budget process. But um, based on the contents of the bill, we don't think it's a good idea right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. I'm Sheena Nash. I'm with the California Department of Public Health. We are in opposition to this bill. Um, the bill does not provide a long-term solution to the funding problems of LC, LTCOP, and without a more comprehensive solution, it will continue to need um, money for funding shortages in the future. Uh, monies from these accounts are set aside for specific purposes as stated in federal and state law. Um, the fund cannot sustain a repetitive diversion of the funding um, and remain solvent for purposes required by the Health and Safety Code. So thank you. Thank you. I'd like to take just a moment to say that earlier I said it was two witnesses, three minutes each. In this committee, our committee, it's two witnesses, two minutes each. I was thinking about when I was presenting in Assembly Health uh, yesterday and that next week when we have a special session on the Mendoza bill for special session, then we will do uh, two witnesses, three minutes. But for everything else, it has always been and will continue to be two witnesses, uh, two minutes each. Um, any comments from committee? The bill has been moved by Senator Cedillo. Uh, a brief close. I urge your aye vote. Thank you. Call for the vote, please. Senator Alquist? Aye. Alquist, aye. Strickland? Aye. Strickland, aye. Honested? No. Honested, no. Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Cox? Leno? Aye. Yeah. Leno, oh, aye. Negretti McLeod? Negretti McLeod, aye. Pavley? Aye. Pavley, aye. Romero? Aye. Romero, aye. That bill has seven votes. It is enough to get out. We will hold it open since we're expecting another member. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Really appreciate it. Thank you. At this point, we are... Senator Leno, uh, who's on Budget Conference Committee, has joined us, so we will go through... And, and Senator Cedillo uh, came recently also. We will go through all the bills. Item 2, AB 113 by Assemblymember Portentino, Senator Cedillo. Aye. Cedillo, aye. Cox, Leno. Aye. Leno, aye. That bill has eight votes. It is out. Uh, the next item is item 3 by Assemblymember Yamada, 1593. Senator Cedillo. Aye. Cedillo, aye. Cox, Leno. Aye. Leno, aye. That bill has eight votes. It is out. The next item is item seven by Assemblymember Valines, AB 1887. Senator Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Cox? Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. That bill has six votes. It is out. Next item is item eight uh, by Assemblyman Fuhrer, AB 2042. Oh, that is the one that, that where testimony was taken, and it will be next week vote only because they are working on some amendments. Uh, next, we have item 9, uh, AB 2153, Assemblyman Lou. Senator Cedillo? Cox? Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Second, please. Lou, aye. Cedillo, aye. That bill has seven votes. It is out. Next, we have item 10 uh, by Assemblyman Nava, AB 2496. Senator Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, aye. Cox? Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Got six eyes. Uh, that bill has six votes. It is out. Next, item 11 by Assemblyman Fuhrer, AB 2555. Seven and that bill was already out, seven to one. All right. Uh, next, we have item 13, uh, ACR 74 by Assemblyman Portentino. Senator Cedillo? 
cuff? The umbilical cord uh, blood banking. Uh, Item 13. 13. Okay. So DOI. So DOI, Cox, Leno. Aye. Leno, I. It's got eight. That bill has eight votes. It is out. Do Next, we have the consent calendar, which, which are items five um, and item 12. Item five is AB 1783 by uh, Assembly Member Hayashi. Item 12 is AB 2635 by Assembly Member Portentino. Senator Cedillo? Aye. Cedillo, I. Cox, Leno. Aye. Leno, I. The consent calendar is out. And uh, eight, eight votes. That is out. Uh, we are done. Meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. <laughs>